moving on from there, last week I dealt with uh, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, right? And I kind of pitted a war between a bunch of generic gods and God of the Bible. And then I pitted another war between Jesus and a bunch of like either a Ouija board or a crystal ball or what they call medium. So there's the mediator versus the medium, right? And there's God and the Bible versus the other generic gods. I'm not going to pit wars today between religions, but I'm going to do it in the way people think. Our culture thinks certain things. They think they have certain attitudes about life that I look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, you have no idea what you're talking about. This is why the world is the way it is. And we're going to actually deal with the verse that is right after the verse that we dealt with last week. Last week it said the verse that we dealt with was, but there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. But then it goes on. There's a comma in the NIV version. It goes on, and it said, And he gave himself as a ransom for many. Now, I want to paint a picture today, okay? And that picture is kind of show us God's heart. But we're going to do that by kind of picking at his brain. What he thinks about what he's saying here. What's, what the Bible actually says. And we're going to do that by kind of really getting, digging deep. It's not going to be too, too deep. It's not going to bog us down. But we're going to go with the first words there. Where it says he gave himself. I'm going to ask two questions. Number one, did he want to? And number two, did he have to? Now, a lot of people will have a lot of opinions about that. A lot of theologians have a lot of, said a lot of things about whether Christ wanted to and whether or not he had to. Let's start out with the first question of whether or not Jesus wanted to give of himself, as 1 Timothy 2, 6 says. Did he actually want to do that? Well, uh, you know, you'll have people tell you, well, of course. Didn't he say, I came to seek and to save the lost? Yeah, he did. He knew he was going to die at the hands of sinners. He knew what was coming. He warned his disciples of it. And he came to, came to seek and to save the lost. And he knew that the only way that was going to happen was if he suffered at the hands of sinners on the cross. But did he actually want to? Some will say no. Some will say yes. I would say no. Did I say he want, He didn't want to save people? No, he wanted to save people. But did he want to give of himself? Did he want to die unto death? But it's not just Nick talking, because who really cares about what Nick Benson says? No one really cares about that. It's what the Bible says. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, he goes out, he takes his 12 disciples in this garden area, in the, in the, in the Judean area, outside Jerusalem, and he takes two of his disciples who are closest to him, James and John, right? And he takes them over and he says, watch out for me while I go over there and pray. And he goes over and he prays. And he starts praying to the Father. And what does he say? He said, Father, if it's possible, let me not drink this cup. If it's possible, let me not go through this. If there's another way that people will be saved, if there's another way that the mission of seeking and saving the lost will be done, let that be the thing that happens. Not this. And we knew, he knew how hard it was because he sweat blood. The, the, the blood vessels in him, it broke. That's actually a medical condition. We uh, go under, undergo a lot of stress. He knew what he had to do, but at the same time, he didn't want to. And we know that because he asked if there's another way. Let it be so. So did he want to go through that? No. That doesn't mean he didn't want to save people or help people or anything like that. He did. But he didn't want to die. He didn't want to suffer. He's not someone who likes suffering and pain. He's not someone who enjoys. He's not what some people might call a sadist or a masochist. He doesn't like to have pain inflicted upon himself. 
In fact, he's the guy that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice the third thing of it. I'm the life. He actually believes in life. He wants to live. He also believed in the resurrection of the dead, which means people who die, he believes that they're going to rise again because he likes life. Plus, also in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, there's a picture of God the Father creating the world. And who does he do it through? He does it through the Son, Jesus. We obviously know throughout Scripture that Jesus likes life. He likes the idea of creation. He doesn't want to die, and he doesn't want to suffer. Who does? This guy, Jesus, that we worship, is not a savior that says, oh, pain is good. No, of course he's not like that. Which gives so much power to the idea that it's an actual sacrifice. You see, you can't actually make a sacrifice unless you give up something that you actually want. He actually wants to live. If I had two pennies right now and I gave it to one of the kids here, that's not much of a sacrifice because, number one, I'm not a penny pincher myself. I, I, maybe I should be more, you know, <laughs> for the sake of the future. But I'm not. That's not me, okay? That, you know, I'm a little bit more loose with my money. You know, not in a bad way. Just I'm just not, I don't, I'm not like a micromanager of my money in every minute, okay? And, and so I, I, take, I look at two pennies and if I were to throw them away to someone, that's not a sacrifice to me because I don't consider it valuable to me as much as I would maybe consider a $100 bill. You see, you can't make a sacrifice unless you give up something you actually want, you actually value on a very high level. Jesus values his life on a very high level. Why? Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way to God. He values his humanity. He values living on earth. And so it actually is a sacrifice. The word has power to it because the word is true. Because he didn't want to die. So why would he give up something that he wanted? Why would he give up his will? Why would he, as 1 Timothy 2, 6 says, deny himself? Why would a man do that? Well, John 4, 34 gives us light on this. Remember, I said, we're painting a picture. We're picking at God's brain. We're trying to understand God's intention. We're trying to understand Jesus' intention. And eventually, it will come around. Uh, I don't know if you, anyone ever remember the guy Bob Ross on television? He used to paint pictures of nature, right? Sometimes you would sit there and you'd watch him painting. And you'd be like, he's telling you, oh, this is going to be a tree. Sometimes you'd say, it's going to be a happy, it's a happy tree, right? And you'd be like, how is that going to be a tree? All he's doing is putting a, that doesn't even look remotely like a tree. Or that doesn't look like a sky. That, does, that looks horrible. It just looks like a bunch of paint on a canvas. And then as he keeps painting and adding on more details, then you start to see it. Oh, I see the genius of Bob Ross. He does know what he's doing. That's how God is with the cross. But we have to pay attention and go through the process of understanding those little details. Just work with God and let the Bible say what the Bible says about the cross. So why did Jesus deny his own will? He says in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. You see, in any relationship, when you love someone, your heart is satisfied by pleasing them, right? That makes sense. If you actually love someone, you want to please them. You want, you, you want, you're, you're invested in their happiness. Well, Jesus is invested in the desire and the will of his Father. It pleases him. It, it actually nourishes him like food to do what his Father wanted him to do. It nourishes him so much that he's willing to go against his own desire not to die. In other words, God, your will be done, not mine. Your will be done, even though he doesn't want to die knowing that that is his Father's will. And that really is a sacrifice. Now let's go to question two. Jesus have to go to the cross. Well, in order to pay for sin, yes. 
if he really was a sinless man. And sin is paid for by a spotless and blemished land, according to the ancient Jews. He needed to, but did he have to? In other words, did he have the ability or the power to opt out, to take plan B, even though there really was a plan? Could he have taken a different route? That's a great question. A lot of people in church history have argued over that question because that's a philosophical question. In other words, if God predestined something to happen, if he says it's going to happen in the future, like, for example, Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, predictions of the, the betrayal of the Messiah, if God says it's going to happen, does it have to happen because it said it's going to happen and God knew it from, from beforehand? I'm not going to answer philosophical questions. I'm not going to do that. That's just going to bog us down. But let's just say this. Let's just look at what the Bible says about what kind of power Jesus actually did have. Okay? It says um, that in John chapter 10, verse 18, no one takes it from me, that is his life, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. And then there's another verse, Matthew 26, 53 says, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father? And he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. God could have even appealed to his Father to protect him from the cross. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense for him to have said that. He had the power to lay down his life. He had the power to raise it up again in resurrection, and he had the power to opt out. In other words, Jesus had a choice. Whatever you want to say about predestination, you go ahead and say it. You argue tooth and nail with other people about these philosophical problems. I'm just going to say, hey, the Bible paints a picture, and I just want to listen to that. Okay? So, not only is Jesus' sacrifice actually a sacrifice because he actually gives up something he actually wants, but he has power to take another route, which gives even more power to what Jesus did when it says he gave himself. Those words shouldn't be ever taken lightly. And I'll tell you, the world does not look at giving yourself as a good thing. The world tells us that we're not supposed to be in self-denial. When I was a younger kid in elementary school, I don't know what subject we were talking about, but I remember this one week where they just kept on harping on us about self-esteem, self-esteem, self, you know? Well, when you esteem someone, you put them on a high pedestal. So they're telling me, now I understand why they're doing it. There are probably kids that, you know, had insecurity problems. That happens and kids are bullied. I, I agree, we don't want kids to look so bad upon themselves, but when you start saying it's all about self, self-esteem, self-acceptance, there's nothing wrong with you ever. That controlled selfishness is going to grow into an uncontrolled selfishness. I've seen sin grow in people firsthand by watching my own family members go through it. I've seen sin grow inside me by watching it happen, by watching my habits perpetuate into a deeper, uh, you know, pit. That's what sin does when we still, when we give it an inch, it will take 20 billion miles. And it will become a tyrant. So anyways, there's a picture that the Bible gives you. Because some people will look at this and say, well, uh, the father sounds like a jerk. It's his will that his son suffers. In fact, there are pastors who I've heard on podcasts who have said, I don't like this view of God the Father because it makes him sound like an irrational anger, anger, you know, he's got an anger problem. He needs anger management. And what they do is they talk about the cross and they'll say, you know, if, if God is so angry at our sin and God is so angry at people and then Jesus comes in and pays for our sin as a ransom, it's like a dad getting angry at his kids and instead of punishing his kids, kicking his dog instead. And he's satisfied. I don't like that vision of God. And this is what I've heard pastors say. You know what? I don't care what pastors say. I care what the Bible says. And I better be right about what the Bible says if I'm going to be preaching it. Okay? So what is the picture? Is it of an irrational guy, God the Father, 
who is an anger problem? No. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. So, what do we have? What's the picture? What's the canvas we see? God self-denying himself, giving his son to the world. The son denying himself, giving up his will and his want for life for the sake of the will of the father, who in his infinite wisdom knew what needed to be done in order for people to be saved. A father self-denying. A son self-denying. So what are we supposed to do? Self-denying. You can say anything you want about the purpose-driven life. But I'll tell you, a better church program? Self-denying. I like that church program. Because the moment you start living in an in a attitude, in a thinking pattern of self-denial, you really understand where God's heart is. Let's go on to the next words. He gave himself as a ransom. Oh, geez. As a ransom. Theologians have argued tooth and nail about this across the centuries. You want to know how confusing it gets? You have some people saying, uh, who did he pay the ransom to? It must have been Satan because God's not an angry, capricious God. Other people saying, no, Satan doesn't have a... He, he, you can't make a ransom payment, which is an exchange for someone's life. You can't do that to Satan because he's not the author of life. And then you have even other people who read a bunch of New Testament verses where it says that we're imprisoned under the law, we are, uh, we are imprisoned and we are held captive under sin and under the devil's snares, and you say, have them say, no, it's the law or it's sin. So what is it? Who are we imprisoned under? Who are we under captivity of? Is it God? Is it Satan? Is it the law or is it sin? Because I have heard multiple opinions go everywhere concerning the ransom payment. Well, let me give you an analogy. Let's say you enter the mafia. All right? And before you know it, your boss, the mafia boss, tells you, okay, go murder this person. All right? So you do it. You know for a fact that under the law, if you were to get caught, you would be sent to jail. Now you might have your mafia boss pay the bill or something like that. But you know that there is a law, it needs to be satisfied, right? But you also know that it's do or die, because if I don't do what my boss tells me, I try to leave the mafia, he might come after me because I know too much. You're held captive under the mafia boss. You're held captive in an empty way of life. But you also know that you've committed crimes, so the law is against you, and you know that if you go to a court judge, he's going to sentence you if he knows that you were the one that did it. That whole scenario is the picture the Bible gives. We are held captive by Satan himself. We are held captive by our empty way of life, by sins. But we are also imprisoned under judgment of the law. And God gave a law in the first place because guess what? God is holy. And there can be no sin on this earth. I'm not afraid or ashamed to say that. So there is a picture, okay? And some people would say, oh, I don't like this vision of God. But you got to remember. Remember the picture I painted for you before, the detail that you got to take into account. God denied himself by giving his son for us. It's like us being sentenced in court after having been committed a crime as, you know, kind of a mafia representative, and then the judge saying, okay, he's condemned, he deserves it, and then taking off his robe and then saying, I'll pay the price for him. Okay? There's multiple things going on at the cross when it says that Jesus paid a ransom. He literally killed multiple birds with one stone. He's multifaceted. So, and what's it based on? It's all based upon the fact in the first place that God has a law, right? God has a will, God has a desire, and we need to abide by it. So, the first point where it says he gave him himself, he's denying himself, right? The second point where it says that he, uh, that that he gave himself as a ransom, he did that so that the law would be satisfied, among other things, because guess what? The will of the Father had to be done. So, what's the attitude we gotta have as Christians? Self-denial, one. Number two, what's the will of the Father? 
Okay? Because if you deny yourself, you're going to actually want to do the will of someone else because you're not doing the will of yourself. It's not about you. And you get to the point, if you mature in this world, you get to the point where you realize it's not about you. Anyone who's a parent knows exactly what I'm talking about. It ain't about you. It just isn't. Selfishness is not good even if it's a controlled selfishness. It never has worked in life. Okay? So, self-denial and the will of the Father. But all of this is for the sake of the many. The many. You see, no matter what arguments people pose against each other about how to understand the cross, the ransom, and no matter what analogy I give to you, at the end of the day, the Father denied himself and the son denied himself, and they both did it for the sake of the many, for people who were stuck in sin under some mafia boss called Satan, who were given over to an empty way of life and would be judged and had no chance. That is hope that God gives us in Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can do that. Now, the reason why I talk about self-denial today and the reason why I talk about the will of the Father is because there is an organization that I debated whether or not even mentioning their name. And I have chosen at this very moment that I'm not going to mention their name because I don't want to give them too much exposure. But I'm going to tell you this. I've read much of their literature in the last couple of months. They're very satanic. And when I say that, I do not mean that I'm reading into something that's not them, their literature that's not there. It is there. And it's influenced our culture. Our culture in the last 40 years, thanks to this organization, among other people and other cultists, have literally influenced this world to the point where it's all about me, baby. That's what my life is all about me. I'm looking out for numero uno. Guess what? Self-denial doesn't allow us to do that. If we're going to follow Jesus, we got to have a life of self-emptying constantly. That isn't easy, but that's maturity. But the only way it's going to make sense, the only way that our self-denial will have any credit to it at all is if it's self-denial on the account of the will of God. If we just deny ourselves for the heck of it, what good is that? But if we understand God's heart by looking at what he did to us in his son and Jesus Christ on the cross, and then we deny our whole self, our desires, our will in our life. If we take the same prayer that Jesus took in when he said, not even though there's another, I know there's no other way. Even though I want it to be another way. And so, not my will. Not, not my desire. And it's not about me. Your will be done. Your will be done. I heard a preacher a long time ago say, those are words that do not include faith. And I laughed. I'm like, are you joking me? You're really saying that? No, those are words that require faith. Because faith is entrustment to God and His will. Every prayer needs to end with, your will be done. Because guess what? God's the master. People don't like the idea of slavery, in America especially. I don't like the idea of slavery. But you know what? I'd rather be a slave to a God that frees me out of self-denial than a slave to my own sin into a mafia boss called Satan. I'd rather be a slave to righteousness, as the Bible says. Because when I'm a slave to someone who already denied himself for me, I'm free. He's my master, and I'm not ashamed of that. He's also my king. Let's pray. Thank you so much that you have given us that freedom, Jesus, by paying a ransom, by making a payment in exchange for our life, for our freedom. Even though you wanted to live, you denied yourself and made that payment and satisfied the law. Thank you so much for that.